<clears throat> okay, so um, thank you the, to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. We're a small startup uh, technology company located up uh, the border uh, in Canada. Um, and uh, what I'll try to do is I will, I will show you very little data, data and, and uh, instead I'll, I'll try to uh, highlight the paradigms on which our um, uh, approach is based. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that uh, at the end. Um, autoimmunity is a very different problem than infectious disease or cancer. I mean, in infectious disease and cancer, uh, vaccines aim to generate immunity against the pathogen or the tumor. In autoimmunity, uh, the problem is, is, uh, uh, is just the opposite. We're trying to blunt a response of, of the host against uh, a number of antigens on self tissues. Um, it's a daunting problem, and I'll try to show you why it's so daunting. It's because uh, to blunt um, autoreactivity against thousands of targets in a particular autoimmune disease without impairing systemic immunity is uh, an impossible uh, dream, so to speak. And so the part of them we've discovered can, you know, happened to us by a bit by, by uh, serendipity, and, that, and then a, a particle uh, therapy platform that we discovered that harnesses that paradigm was even more serendipity, and I'll explain that to you how it we all went. So type 1 diabetes is a disease that I work on. Um, I worked on type 1 diabetes for for 18, 20 years, um, and uh, this is just a cartoon that, that tries to uh, summarize very briefly uh, what happens during an autoimmune disease, in this case, type 1 diabetes. So at the top, you have, let's see, pointer here. This is the pancreas. Uh, this is the islets of Langerhans. This is a draining leaf node. Um, so you have a dendritic cell, a resident dendritic cell in the pancreas. We all have those healthy people as well as, uh, as diseased people. This dendritic cell uh, you know, moves around, and its job is to uh, capture antigens from the milieu, you know, antigens that are shed from pancreatic beta cells during normal physiological uh, re you know, renewal uh, of, of the cells. And then this dendritic cell then takes that cargo and moves it to the draining leaf nodes, um, where in normal circumstances we probably induce tolerance of autoreactive cells. In the case of patients who are, who are susceptible to undergoing type 1 diabetes or other autoimmune diseases, I mean, you could, you could, you could, you know, I'm, I'm using type 1 diabetes as an example, but this probably happens in all autoimmune diseases. This, um, this dendritic cell that, that is loaded with autoantigens then processes and presents those peptides uh, to autoreactive CD4 and CD8 T cells that happen to be in our immune system. Uh, these cells become activated uh, uh, and become differentiated, differentiated into cytotoxic lymphocytes. They migrate through the bloodstream. They find their way back into the pancreas. They find their cognate peptide MHC complexes on the surface of the pancreatic beta cell. They chew up the beta cell and they kill it. And, and then that happens, uh, you know, multiple times over the course of the life of the individual until the individual becomes insulin uh, dependent. And so the patient has to take uh, insulin injections. Now, these diseases are, are enormously complex from the antigenic point of view. Um, there, is, there is thousands of, of, of targets that are represented by, by multiple epitopes on a growing list of autoantigens. This is just, I'm listing a few here on the left that are targeted by, by autoreactive CD8 positive T cells, and a few here on the right that are targeted by autoreactive CD4 positive T cells. And within these, each of these antigens, and many more that, are, that are keep coming into the, out of the woodwork, um, there are multiple epitopes that are being targeted. Um, the list of antigens that, or epitopes that are being targeted is, is as I said, uh, repeating myself, is uh, steadily growing. Uh, that means that we do not know where uh, the end will be. There are probably thousands of autoreactive T cell specificities. That poses a significant, a significant problem in us developing uh, uh, disease-specific and antigen-specific uh, uh, approaches to blunt autoreactivity without compromising systemic immunity, and that's why to, the, to this day there is nothing in the market that enables you to do that. And all the approaches that are currently available will have, re represent a significant compromise between blunting autoreactivity at the expense of compromising systemic immunity and therefore increasing the chances or the likelihood that the patient will develop infection or cancer in the long run. Now, the paradigm that we've discovered is that uh, is based on the following observation. And, and the first is 
that within each of these auto-reactive auto, auto auto specificities, there is a range of clones targeting you know, each individual epitope. At one end of the spectrum within each of these clones, you have the high ability autoreactive T cell clones, which are the ones that will differentiate into effector cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which will, will pri primarily partake in uh, and contribute to destroying the target in the autoimmune disease. That's, that's a no-brainer. I mean, that's, that's something everybody knows, and everybody would, would have expected to, that to be the case. What we discovered is that the clones that sit at the other end of the spectrum, which most patients uh, do have, and most healthy individuals in the population do have, we do all, we do have a, a low ability to reactive T cells in our immune system. What they do is they function as, as, a, as, a, negative, as a source of a negative feedback regulatory loop uh, that aims to blunt or uh, uh, autoreactive, pathogenic autoreactive T cell responses. And they do that by differentiating into memory uh, autoregulatory uh, T lymphocytes that attempt to blunt the uh, diapathogenic activity or the pathogenic activity of their higher ABDT counterparts. Now, the paradigm states, is, is, it is this how we, we frame the paradigm, is the low ABT clones within each autoantigenic specificity become memory autoregulatory CD positive T cells in response to chronic antigenic stimulation in an attempt to blunt disease progression affected by their higher ability counterparts. It's important that I highlight the following thing. In autoimmunity, antigen never disappears. You know, uh, uh, this is different than in, in, an, in an infection. In an acute infection, the immune system wipes out the antigen. The effector cells uh, that remain after the attrition phase have now the chance to become memory effector uh, lymphocytes. In autoimmunity, antigen does not disappear. Uh, pancreatic beta cells uh, stay in the body uh, for, for a long time uh, prior to the patient uh, developing type 1 diabetes, and it's this chronic autoantigenic stimulation that fuels that negative feedback regulatory loop. Now, this is just a cartoon that summarizes the paradigm for you, and that's how it goes. So for every autoantigenic specificity or epitope specificity, you have the high ability T cell clone here, the low ability T cell clone here, all recognizing the same peptide mid C class 1 complex. Now, the high ability T cell clone differentiates into an effector cell, that becomes a cytotoxic lymphocyte, kills the pancreatic beta cell. When this effector CTL becomes exposed to uh, their cognate uh, autoantigen in a subsequent uh, encounter with a dendritic cell or with another pancreatic beta cell, it tends to undergo reactivation and do cell death. So the opportunities for this effector T cell to become memory T cell are quite limited. In contrast, the low ABDT uh, brothers and sisters of these high ABDT T cell clones uh, they like the tickling uh, by their cognate peptide C complexes, and instead of differentiating to, into an effector uh, pathogenic autoreactive clone, the, uh, population, they differentiate into, uh, in response to chronic re-exposures to peptide C uh, displayed by, um, by um, autoantigen loaded dendritic cells, they uh, develop into a memory uh, population that has regulatory properties. This population of memory-like regulatory cells is autoreactive, so they're autoregulatory cells. Uh, and what they do is they sit in the original leaf nodes, and when they re-engage peptate MHC on the surface of an antigen-presenting cell, what they do is they suppress the antigen-presenting cell, and they also kill it. And remember that this antigen-presenting cell is loaded not just with a cognate uh, autoantigen that this population of cells recognizes, but is loaded with the th all thousands of antigens that a beta cell has. And therefore, the paradigm predicted that a single monospecific autoregulatory CD8 T cell population should be able to blunt a very complex auto-polyantigenic autoimmune response locally without compromising systemic immunity. Now, where, where is our nanoparticle therapeutic approach come from? Um, uh, of course, it didn't come from by design. It came by, purely by serendipity. And what we did is, what we rationalized was that we could use iron oxide nanoparticles, and if we decorated them with disease-relevant peptide MHC complexes, we could use them as baits uh, and as probes for um, uh, uh, um, labeling cognate autoreactive T cells in peripheral blood that would then ferry the iron oxide to the pancreas, and that would enable us to image pancreatic islet inflammation in vivo in real time. That was the rationale for using these nanoparticles and, and, and spending time in encoding them and, uh, with peptide C complexes. 
it occurred to us as we were doing, so we did those, we did those experiments and all of that was fine, but it occurred to us that we perhaps could use that these peptide emission coding nanoparticles to induce tolerance of cognate autoreactive T cells. And the concept was very simple. I mean, you have a solid surface that displays a, a, a peptide emission complex in the absence of co-stimulatory molecules. Any lymphocyte engaging that peptide emission complex in the absence of co-stimulation should, should undergo deletion or energy and therefore should, should be tolerized. And so we thought that one could possibly use pools of nanoparticles coded with many different peptide emission complexes, as many as you could get your hands on to, and perhaps that way you'll be able to dent the autoimmune response. But lo and behold, what happened to us is when we injected nanoparticles coded, coded with just one peptide emission complex, was this is relevant, not only we were not inducing tolerance of that population, but actually the, the population of cognate autoreactive cells was expanding in the animals. And, and that's when the Eureka moment came and we realized that the peptide emission nanoparticles were actually harnessing the paradigm that we were discovering at the same time using other approaches. And so again, this is the same cartoon that I showed you earlier. So you have the high T cell clones, they become effector T cells, they kill pancreatic beta cells, they get re-exposed to antigen, eventually they die. Um, then you have the low ABD T cell clones, they become memory autoregulatory T cells that suppress, that aim to suppress or blunt uh, autoreactivity by, by killing and suppressing the autoantigen loading dendritic cell. Now, the nanoparticles do the following things. The nanoparticles do interact with the effect of CTLs and do kill them. But remember, this is just one a specificity out of a thousand, right? So, so, so that is inconsequential in terms of the disease. You can, you, if you eliminate one of, one of the 1,000, nothing is going to happen in the disease because you have 999 soldiers are still, uh, you know, uh, punching uh, holes into, into, into the pancreas. These nanoparticles also delete cognate naive autoreactive T cells, those that, that have uh, high affinity T cell receptors for the antigen. But again, that's inconsequential for the disease because it's one specificity out of many. But what the nanoparticles really do is they, when they, 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 um, they, they f uh, promote the, exp the expansion of disease generated autoregulatory T cell memory. Remember, T cell memory is co-stimulation independent. And so these particles can selectively expand memory that the disease has already generated, and they do so extremely well. And so a nanoparticle co coded with a single disease-relevant peptidemitsi complex by expanding a monospecific population of autoregulatory CD8 cells or CD4 cells, because we've shown that this, this paradigm applies to both compartments, that population of cell now can blunt all the activation of all other autoreactive T cell specificities driven by a single antigen presenting cell. This is just an example, and that's almost the only data that I'm going to show you, of what happens when we treat diabetic animals. These are spontaneously diabetic animals that develop a, a highly polygenic, a polyantigenic autoimmune response in the non obese diabetic mouse. This is the time in, in weeks, uh, uh, the zero is uh, the, the time when we start treatment. This is blood glucose levels. We monitor the animals until the animals become hyperglycemic and then we begin treating them. So you have two lines here. This is just an example. So in the red is an animal that is not treated with anything, is a control mouse, was treated with control nanoparticles, coded with a control, a totally irrelevant peptidemitsi complex. You can see the animals progress to frank hyperglycemia as one would expect. The animals that are treated with uh, monospecific um, uh, peptidemitsi coded nanoparticles now, they revert to normal glycemia. Uh, we maintain them in normal glycemic for at least four consecutive weeks to make sure that they, that they stay normal glycemic. Then we withdraw treatment, and most of the animals remain normal glycemic uh, 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 <coughs> forever. Now, we've optimized this, and we can get a massive expansions of uh, autoregulatory T cells. And you can read in between the lines as to the number of things that we can do with this technology. Um, this is just, uh, uh, you can see that this is tetramer staining uh, and this is CD8 staining. Uh, this is the uh, blood profiles of two mice uh, st stained, uh, treated with these nanoparticles, with, with uh, nanoparticles coded with the, the type 1 diabetes relevant peptide emitsi class 1 complex. Uh, this is uh, the cells in peripheral blood stained with a negative control tetramer. You can see that there is very little staining or anything, any staining as one would expect. You can see here that almost one, uh, between one and, 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 and four 
um, uh, one out of uh, four or one out of two CD8 cells in peripheral blood are cognate to the peptide emitsy complex that is in the nanoparticles. That's a massive expansion of, of T cells, and all these T cells have regulatory properties. Now, the conclusions are um, that treatment with nanoparticles squared with disease well on peptide emitsy class one and or class two complexes is a practical, feasible, and readily translatable approach to blunt highly complex autoimmune responses. It does not really matter what peptide emitsy complex is squared into nanoparticles. We've tested up to seven, and all of them have met uh, the predictions of the paradigm, provided that it is, there is a target of the diabetogenic autoimmune response, regardless of its prevalence or antigenic dominance. Every single autoreactive T cell specificity has a low ability T cell population that mounts a negative feedback uh, autoregulatory loop. This approach harnesses, we do not, we do not create uh, anything that Mother Nature has not already invented for us. We harness a natural phenomenon, it expands, we do not induce disease generated out of regulatory T cell memory. We do not generate the memory, the disease generates the memory for us, we just simply expand the memory to blunt disease. It should be applicable to multiple autoimmune diseases. And this approach suppresses autoimmune disease without compromising systemic immunity because the dendritic cells that are targeted are only those that uh, have, uh, are loaded with uh, peptide C, uh, they're loaded with, with uh, uh, tissue-derived autoantigens. And just my last slide is that the therapy key, uh, key features are that this novel and well-defined mechanism of action, I mean, we know the mechanism of action is novel, and we know the details of this mechanism of action. We have a therapy-specific biomarker, which is the expansion of cognate autoregulatory T cells. It's very easy. You draw a little bit of blood, and you, and you ask yourself if the therapy is working. In patients who do not have, or in mice that do not have diabetes, nothing happens. There is no expansion of anything um, in peripheral blood. Um, only a few compounds would be needed to treat most disease individuals in the population. Um, and a single therapeutic platform can be used to treat multiple autoimmune diseases. Just one platform, one mechanism of action to treat not just diabetes, but possibly all autoimmune diseases. Um, so, or so I'm hoping. And all constituents, nanoparticles, and peptide monomers have been used in the clinic before. So it's likely that the two together will be safe. And, and that's uh, what we're trying to do as we speak. So I'll stop here in the interest of time. Thank you very much. So can I just ask the, the first question? Um, sure. which, which is, um, if you give these um, uh, particles to a non-diabetic mouse, are you, have you looked at that and do you not expand any cells no matter how many times you give them? Right, so, so we've done this in two different ways. We've, we've treated animals that are congenic for the MHC molecules that afford diabetes susceptibility in the not mouse, uh, but are diabetes resistant because they don't have all the non-MHC uh, link genes that, that, that are required for susceptibility. When these animals are treated with these nanoparticles, there is, there is, there is no expansion of anything. Um, there, is no, uh, there is no infiltration of the pancreas, there's absolutely nothing. I mean, these animals do not generate, because they do not have a diabetogenic process, they do not generate autoregulatory T cell memory, therefore the nanoparticles are inconsequential. We've also generated a knock in uh, an NOD mouse that had, um, they had uh, uh, an autoantigen. The, the peptide that was coded onto the nanoparticles, um, the gene that encoded this peptide was mutated so as to prevent the animals from mounting memory against this epitope. Uh, the animals still develop diabetes in the absence of this epitope, but cannot generate memory against the epitope. When we treated these animals with the nanoparticles coded with the epitope bound to the cognate MHC molecule, uh, there was no expansion either. Uh, so the, the, the disease generates a memory. If there is no disease, there is no regulatory memory. And so, so only, pay, only people who are predisposed or are mounting an immune response against the, against the autoantigen will generate the memory, and these will be the only ones who will respond to the nanoparticles. Yes? Uh, how many epitopes did you try this against? We've, we tried with, with four, two, two uh, uh, mouse disease relevant, uh, two uh, human disease relevant in a humanized, in humanized NOD mice. We've tried uh, with three different peptide MHC class two complexes. Um, uh, in the class two system, I don't have time, I didn't have time to, to show the data, but the cells that expand are T regulatory one cells, so they're autoreactive, uh, and they, are, they have a phenotype of, of T regulatory one cells, uh, memory like as well, make IL 10, they do not make anything else. So when you're getting the humans, uh, do you think they need to be tested to actually have any memory responses? 
No. No, no, because the paradigm states, the paradigm states that, um, that, um, that any epitope uh, that is being targeted to the disease process will generate regulatory memory. And, and everything, you know, all the antigens that we've tested so far have met that, that prediction. Uh, the other thing that I have to say is, for example, T regulatory one cells are known to exist in, in healthy uh, relatives uh, of diabetic patients that are, that are pre diabetic, for example, or even in diabetic individuals. These, these TR1 like uh, autoreactive C4 cells that have been cloned from humans um, exist at a, at a relatively high frequency in patients, and they, they've been shown to kill antigen-presenting cells that are loaded with, with antigens, which is exactly what our paradigm states. So, um, no, there's no need to, to, to test whether or not a patient will have memory against the, ep the epitope. Autoimmunity? No, no, autoimmunity is epitope specific, but autoimmunity is polyepitope specific. I mean, autoimmunity involves recognition of multiple epitopes or multiple antigens. That doesn't mean that the disease is, is initiated on, a on recognition of a particular epitope, but once the disease has, be has begun and is, and is evolving, there is epitope spread it, uh, spreading and there is multiple epitopes or multiple proteins being targeted. And so there is no other way of planting autoreactivity, any other way that I know of, of planting autoreactivity without compromising systemic immunity.